Um, from the time we opened our doors, what we soon realized is that by far our most popular services were our social media management services. We found that entrepreneurs simply either didn't have the intrinsic knowledge about social media or they didn't want to invest the time that it takes to devise and maintain an effective and consistent content media uh, marketing strategy. And it's out of those insights that our, our new brand, Smack It, was born. Smack It stands for Social Media Content Kits, and they're basically out of the box, ready to go, pre-packaged uh, social media kits, specifically for psychotherapists, psychologists, counselors, and mental health professionals. Um, and again, I just devised a little video to show you what Smack It is all about. <laughs> So that's Smack It, and we'll be rolling those out into other industries in the near future. The reason I show you this is because I will be referencing Smack It as a reference point, just as I go through and talk about the social media best practices that you can use to elevate your social media marketing strategy as well. So as I kick off this discussion, uh, I'm going to kick it off with a poll. So just so I can get a read from you guys um, and what's happening, you know, what you guys are using. I know we mentioned that we're going to focus primarily on Facebook and Instagram, but just to get, uh, just out of curiosity, uh, David, if you could please launch that first poll of how many uh, social media platforms do you guys, are you guys currently using to promote your business? Is it five or more, three or four, a couple or none? So open up that poll and just leave it for a few seconds just to get a read from the audience. Okay, and I don't think I see the results popping up on my end just because of the platform I'm using to present. Uh, so David, if you could just give a high level overview of what the results look like, are we getting any results on, on that? <laughs> Uh, I have uh, shared the results. I'm not sure if they're visible to you or not, but uh, in any case, 15% um, had indicated they're uh, on one to three to four uh, platforms, 46% one to two, and 38% uh, said they are on no platforms. Oh, okay. So that's pretty interesting. So that's actually one of the, uh, and thank you for, for summarizing that uh, for me. Um, so this is one of the most popular questions we tend to get asked from our clients. Um, you know, how many social media platforms should I be on to promote my practice? And this is always my rule of thumb answer to leverage only as many social media, media platforms as you can do well. It's much better to have one social media account that you maintain really well than to spread yourself too thin and have several accounts that you simply aren't. I mean, obviously, the more accounts you're on is the more exposure you'll have. But social media, just like any other space, you really should know your strengths, know your limitations, continue to play to your strengths, and while you grow at a pace that's comfortable for you and your practice. So whether that means eventually getting to the point where you're outsourcing that capability, uh, whether you're bringing in additional resources to help you manage that, or you're acquiring that knowledge yourself, but just be sure that you're expanding at a pace that makes sense for you and your business. <clears throat> okay, so let's dive right in. Which of the platforms is best for your business? Is it Facebook or is it Instagram? And again, um, we find that, uh, you know, Facebook being a legacy platform, people tend to start there either with Facebook or with Instagram or both. But again, let's just get a read of you guys and see where you guys are playing and in which space. So David, again, if you could please launch that second poll, which basically asks, which social media platforms of those two do you use currently to promote your services? Is it just Facebook? Is it just Instagram? Is it both Facebook and Instagram? Or is it neither of those? <clears throat> so just give that a few seconds. So 
So David, what are the results? Are we getting any results on that one? Okay, um, from this poll, we have 8% uh, that are using just Facebook, 12% uh, just Instagram, 20% uh, that are on both Facebook and Instagram, and 60% are on neither one. Ah, oh, okay, so that's pretty interesting. So, um, you know, social media really is um, uh, a, a very strong platform. I mean, you're looking at the fact that it is 24 seven marketing, right? It's the, not the sheer number of people that's on the platform. Um, it really gives you an opportunity to use your unique voice even more than if you have a website because you're constantly posting. So it gives you that unique brand and voice. So it really is a platform, a strong marketing platform that we, um, we highly encourage you to play in that space. Um, here are some demographics, whether you are on Facebook or Instagram or neither at this point. I just thought some of these demographics might be interesting to you. So you'll see that generally on Instagram, um, you have that younger audience. So if you are just on Facebook, no matter how that is serving your audience today, the fact is if you're looking towards that longer term growth of your practice, Instagram is really where you're going to start targeting that younger audience. The other aspect we can look at between the differences between the two is the engagement. So while the average time you see spent on Facebook is still higher than on Instagram, right? You really have seen the trends in terms of, right? Again, forward looking in terms of the trends of the engagement uh, on both of those platforms. Now, don't get me wrong, Facebook isn't going away anytime soon. But again, this is more of a current and perhaps future state overview of the two platforms in terms of the potential re relevance for you and your practice. Now, there are differences between the two platforms and three main ones that I'm just going to just very briefly touch on. First of all, aesthetics. So, you know, both it's it's important, but Instagram is very much more of an aesthetic heavy platform. So that means that the look and feel of your content matters. And we'll touch on that in a moment. Secondly, hashtags. So again, Instagram is a very hashtag heavy platform. And again, we're going to touch on how do you best use hashtags to increase your visibility uh, later on in the, in the presentation. And thirdly, text links, right? You have on Facebook, you can post text, link, text links and they're clickable and hyperlinked. And on Instagram, they're not, which I'm not sure why they don't. Um, I mean, you can certainly drop links in there and people can copy, paste it and drop it into a browser, um, but it's just not as user friendly from that perspective. So having looked at both platforms, uh, let's just dive into the social media best practices that you can use to implement and tap into the power of both of these platforms. As I said, the social media really is a very, very powerful platform that runs 24 seven. You're sleeping and this can be marketing for you, right? But how do you tap into, how do you dress up? Let's start with your social media profile. How do you dress it up so that you really get the maximum visibility from your social media profile? And for this, we're really going to use Instagram because Instagram is where you have that flexibility in terms of how you set up your um, Instagram bio as opposed to Facebook, which is a little bit different in terms of the setup there. So the first best practice that I want to point out is that for your social media users or your Instagram usernames, we're talking about this name here, is actually a searchable term, right? So this name should differ from your Instagram account name, which is this to this one here. Within your Instagram username, you really want to use keywords. Now keywords are the popular words and terms that consumers use to search for products and services online. So within your Instagram username, you really want to be using keywords there because people can search and find you through that. And I'll just show you how that works. So for example, so I'll just point out that where possible, I use examples from your field so that it's more relatable to you. But in some cases, I deliberately shy away from that because I don't want to inadvertently pull up someone's profile. Someone joins one of my events and then now I'm throwing shade. So in this case, I deliberately used an example from a different industry. So you'll see on the left here, for example, um, right, the Instagram account name, we'll call it at the top is what is it? Accident Professionals. But then you'll see the actual username is personal injury experts, which is if you're looking for that kind of service, that's more what you'd likely to be searching for. Whereas the one on the right, you'll see that the username and the account name is just mirrored and it's not very searchable. So that wouldn't be a best practice. And here I give you just some examples of how this can play out for you guys. So, for example, bilingual school psychotherapist, 
child psychologist Alberta, anxiety therapist, those are some of the ways you might want to use keywords into your username. The thing to bear in mind is that there is a 30 character limit for your username, so you want to be very deliberate. There's a consideration there about how you structure that username. Another best practice when you're setting up your bio on Instagram would be to use um, bullet points. Uh, people just aren't as interested in us or our services as we'd like to think. So people come to our profile and what they're going to do is they're going to stand. They don't read. They're not going to sit and read long sentences or paragraphs. So bullet points tend to be a much more effective way of laying out or much more effective format for your Instagram profile. The third best practice to bear in mind, and I think everyone on Instagram, I tend to see they have this as a call to action. So a call to action would be where you want to direct the user to go next. So a lot of people use LinkedIn bio or they would have their website here. So you want to always make sure you have a call to action. This here crosses kind of in over into content and content we're going to cover quite a lot later on into the presentation. But since we're here, we're just going to cover it off. So <clears throat> if you want to feature short form content, you feature it on stories. So stories tend to be videos up to 60 seconds long. And they tend to be featured here as opposed to within your Instagram feed and it would feature for up to 24 hours. So if you have any content that's timed specific, so let's say you're hosting an event or you're attending an event, or you want to get eyes on something within the next little while, you would feature it as a story. And then once that disappears off of your story, as I mentioned, it features for up to 24 hours, then what you would do or what you could do, you certainly don't have to, is you can feature that as a story highlight. So this is what we would call in marketing evergreen content, because when you think, Every time you post onto your social media, that information or that post is scrolling down, right? So your feed is constantly renewing. And as I mentioned, people just aren't as interested as we'd like to think. So our users aren't going to necessarily scroll back 20, 30, 40 weeks to see what we posted before. So if there's something very pertinent to your business that you want to keep very accessible to users to your profile, you want to use this here for your story highlights. It's best to organize your story highlights by content themes. So for example, for you guys, that might look like something like self-care tips might be a story highlight. About me could be another one. Behind the scenes of my practice could be another story highlight. Do add some personality for, to this section. For example, if you like to travel, my travels could be a story highlight. Or if you're a foodie, food loves could be a story highlight. Remember, social media is about being social and building engagement. And particularly in the field that you're in, which is very people-based and very service-based, that becomes infinitely more integral to your social media strategy. So we're really starting to talk about content, right? So let's talk about the aesthetics. As I mentioned, in when it comes to your social media in general, but particularly within Instagram and the Instagram platform, um, your looks really do matter, right? So here I'm just showing a couple examples or a few examples from our social media content kits and what the feed would look like if you were to use our social media content kits. And you can see it's a very clean, crisp aesthetic. And we're going to discuss why that's important. So when you think of, if you're going to go into enter a store or whether it's a brick and mortar store or whether you are going to a digital, digital store or to a restaurant, for example, I want you to start thinking for yourself, what are those elements that really highlight to you the professionalism of the store, the type of product or service you're going to get, the level of um, service or the type of product you're going to get there? And again, whether it's actually true or not, we're talking about the first perception that you get just by looking at it, right? So if you're thinking of going to a store, everything before you even enter the store, everything from how the, the, the signage is displayed, their branding, if you go into a restaurant, how the, the menus are displayed, and exactly the same with an online digital profile. So I'll just illustrate for you. For example, with these two, they're both barbershops, right? So you have the website on the left and you have the website on the right. And I'm not going to say anything, but you just already start to get a feel and a perception for the quality of service that you might get just from the look and feel of their websites. Next, if you were to overlay on top of that their, um, their social media profile, so on the right, 
you have where, right, you have a few images, not very well curated. The last image, when you look at it, was posted maybe 20, 30 weeks ago, as opposed to the one on the left, which had a really sleek website. They have well curated images. It's right up to date. It's really well showcasing, showcasing their services. Which one to you says that you're going to get a much more professional level of service? And this is going to this is going to apply exactly the same to your um, social media profile as well. Now, as I said, we're really starting to dive into content here, right? And when it comes to content, content, as they say in marketing, really is king, right? Content really is the crux of your social media strategy. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time on this area. So first of all, what should your content even look like? And this is another question we get quite often from clients that come to us, right? If it is that we're supposed to be posting, you know, frequently and consistently, which you'll see is an overarching theme throughout this entire presentation, what's the best content mix? How do I keep it varied and interesting? Where do I get content ideas from? What should my posts even say, right? And the answer to all of those questions is content themes. And I'm going to show you exactly how this works. So to illustrate, um, this is, uh, I'll, again, I'm going to reference our social media content kit. So if you were to purchase one of our kits, basically it comes with a file, right? That has everything you need to post. So it has all the captions already pre-written. It has the optimized hashtags that's provided for each post. And it also has a direct link to whether it's an image or a video. So you literally just click, you copy and you drop it in and you're good to go, right? You've already posted. And these are some of the profiles, some, some, some of the content themes that you already start to see within our social media content. Page. So there's welcome the month, which you'll see at the start of every month. Food and mood is one of our um, uh, the content themes talking about emotions, statistics. In fact, there are, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. In fact, there are 13 different um, content themes within our social media content kits. And that's changing and up being updated all the time. Now, you certainly don't need that many. Uh, this is kind of a visual representation of some of the themes within our content kits, but five or six could probably be sufficient for you. And this is how it would work. So if you start to think you're thinking of what those themes are of content that you want to post around every month, and if let's say you have five or six, and if you start to think almost a color coded spreadsheet, and if you assign a different color to each content theme, what that then does is a couple of things. First of all, it helps keep you balanced, right? So if you're thinking of, okay, well, I'm seeing a lot of red, I've posted a lot of did you know content, but I didn't, I haven't posted anything yellow or green lately, right? So with depression or stats and metrics, right? It just keeps your content balanced. The other thing it helps you with, it just helps to prompt you on what content to post next. Cause that's the other thing, right? I've posted about this, I've posted about that. I just don't know what to say next. Whereas if you have content themes, you'll be like, oh, I haven't posted anything about emotions in a while, or maybe I need to go out and just grab a stat and a metric that I can post about because I haven't posted in that a while. So it also prompts you from that perspective as well. Now, when we're talking about building your content themes and your content, there are some best practices that I want you to bear in mind. The first one I want you to bear in mind is the 80-20 rule. Now, the 80-20 rule basically says that a large proportion of your content should be general interest content. Now, when I say general interest, I'm saying general interest, but within the context of your field. So this should be industry specific content, but not content that's necessarily specific to you or your business. So when you start to think um, the goal of social media really is kind of a getting to know you, right? It's an engagement platform. So the people who are following you are getting to know, right, about you, your practice, what you're all about. So it's almost like building a friendship. Now, I don't know if you have that friend where the friendship is always all about them, right? All they ever talk about is me, 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 me. My kids are so great. I'm getting my hair done. I'm going on vacation. My husband is awesome. I'm getting a new, you can't get a word in edgewise, right? Do you know that friend? You don't want to be that friend on social media either, right? It's all about me because friendships like that, they don't tend to last very long. So general interest content. So these again are some examples from our social media content kits. So when I say general interest content, content like, commemorative days. So this would be a post that you would get around, um, for example, this was for Stress Awareness Day. 
um, factual content. So food and mood is one of our content themes. That just enables you to provide insight, like to post content and to provide insight into who you are and to connect with your audience on a different, more personal level. Okay. The other best practice I want you to bear in mind are SEO and keywords. Now, SEO stands for search engine optimization. Search engine optimization is basically all the best practices that you would use to get yourself ranking higher on search engines. So for example, if you think when you search for things on Google, right, the people come up first on the page or you come up fifth on the page. And keywords are just one part of search engine optimization. And that's what we're gonna drill down into. There are other aspects to SEO, but we're just gonna focus on keywords and how it applies to your social media strategy. Five things I want you to bear in mind in terms of using keywords for social media. First of all, they should be featured in your username and bio, and that we covered off already. The second area is actually within your social media content. So the, the captions that you use when you're posting on social media, that should also contain keywords as well, as much as it's relevant. And that you'll see is something that's included within our social media content kits. The next um, best practice in terms of keywords would be for your hashtags. And again, we're going to drill down into hashtags and best practices on how to use that later on in the presentation. The other area you should be using keywords for is, is image alt text. Now, if you have a website, you should already be familiar with image alt text. Alt text basically tells search engines, and in this case, social media algorithms, what images are about. So again, if you have a website, right, what Google does, or in this case, algorithms, social media algorithms, they're reading your text and looking for keywords. And that's what tells them how relevant your content is to what people are searching for, right? And that will tell them how highly to feature your content as opposed to someone else's, right? If it's relevant to what people are searching for. Now, when you think of images, Google and also in uh, social media algorithms cannot read images, right? You put an image, it has no idea what that is. So you need to tell both Google, for example, on your website, or in this case, algorithms, you need to tell them every time you post an image, what that image is about. And as far as is possible or as relevant, you'd want to include your keywords in image alt text. So let me show you how this works. So if you post on Instagram, you'll be familiar with this page, right? This is where you're posting. So you've uploaded your image, you're ready to post. You're about to write your caption, or in our case, if you bought a social media content kit, you copied your caption that we've already written for you and you just drop it in. And then you add your location. So I don't know if you're familiar with that as well. You can also add your location. So if you are servicing a particular area in Ottawa, for example, the algorithm will serve your content up a little more strongly in that particular area and geography that's relevant to you. And then you have this little drop down box here where it says image alt text. So whether you're including keywords or not, every image you post and Facebook is also similar, should always have alt text to tell the algorithm what your image is about. And as far as is possible or as much as is possible, that should include keywords. And the fifth best practice when it comes to keywords is to be consistent. And you'll see that's an overarching theme when it comes to social media, the social media presentation, because you are training the algorithm to learn what your content and your uh, feed and profile is about. So the more you use these five best practices is the more the algorithm is going to learn um, and be trained about what, what content you have and how relevant you are to what people are searching for. Okay, so you've heard quite a lot from me. I'm going to pause um, for a third poll. Uh, David, if you could please launch this poll as our next one. We're going to start talking about content types and content. Um, so when we talk about content types, we're talking about images, videos, stories, carousel posts, for example. So carousel posts, I'm not sure if you're familiar. If you have one post, right, it's those that has multiple images on the one post. You post one post and then you can click on the right and you see another image and another image and all within the one post. That's a carousel post. So for those of you who are on either Facebook or Instagram, how many different content types have you used on Facebook or Instagram within the past month? Would you say it's more than three or four different content types? Three or four, two or three, maybe just one. So you're just posting images none because you haven't been posting recently or not applicable because you're not on the platform. 
to just open that up and leave that for a few seconds. And again, David, when uh, ever you, you want to call it, if you could just summarize, that would be great, please. All right, in terms of content types, uh, no one has indicated, 0% have indicated they've shared more than three or four, 9% have shared three to four, 9% uh, also have shared two to three, 26% have shared one, 22% uh, have shared none, and 35% in indicated that the question was not applicable. Right. Thank you. Thank you for summarizing that. So yeah, so that's actually pretty typical, um, right? We tend to stick to what we know, and it's easy to whether it's posting images. But the fact is that algorithms on social media are designed to reward users who use a variety of content types, which absolutely makes sense, right? When you think they've spent a lot of money putting all these features in place, right? Whether it's stories or polls or different content types. So they want to see that their users are using those different content types. But having said that, while you're using a variety of content types, you definitely want to be tapping into those that garner you the most engagement. And at one time, and this was not that long ago, it used to be carousel posts. So on Instagram, they would highly favor if you use those carousel posts because it would keep people on their platform for longer as you're scrolling through, which is what their entire um, objective is. Now, as Instagram is making that strategic play against TikTok, which absolutely makes sense for them, they more highly favor videos. And if you are on Instagram at all, what you'll notice lately is the way you post videos, they've even changed, right? So videos used to be able to go just as how you post an image, you would go to this exact same place and you would click and you would just post a video. Now they've changed it to a reel, which means that you post it in a slightly different place. It shows up as a reel. It also shows up on your feed. The other thing about reels is that reels are actually formatted to a different size as would be an Instagram post, which made it really interesting for us at the Smack It's team because we obviously share, we, we include a lot of videos um, in our content kits, industry relevant videos for you guys. Um, so we had to go back into all our kits and, you know, reformat to make sure that when you buy a kit that it comes to the right format, you can just copy and paste it and post it and it's ready for you guys to go. But the point being that as algorithms are updated, you really want to keep abreast of the latest best practices so that you're continuing to have the algorithm favor favoring your content. And I'm going to share some resources to help you do that at the end of the presentation. Uh, so this is, as I was talking about, a range of different content types that you have, right, from live events to carousel posts to polls. You can poll your audience. You have stories. You have images. So you want to make sure that you're using a wide range of those as much as possible. Now, when it comes to marketing in general, and I touched on it already, uh, and social media in particular, it's really important to remain frequent and consistent. There's no silver bullet when it comes to marketing. It's a gradual build of your brand, of your message, of your engagement, whatever your objective is on social media. And particularly when it comes to organic content, so we're not talking about the paid ads, it really is a gradual build. And just to illustrate, these three brands, which I'm sure we are all familiar with, right, achieved international status, and they continue to use marketing and social media in particular to continue to remain top of mind. So how much more important it is for small brands like us to use those tools and resources as well to continue to build our brand and our brand presence. As I mentioned, social media gives you ample opportunity to showcase your personality and to be authentic. So for example, clients who purchase our social media content kits, right, will get this question, if you're writing the content for me and if you're doing all the in the images and videos, how is it that I'm going to show my personality? And we've done, we've, we've formatted them in such a way that it has lots of opportunity, you know, whether the captions you want to change out, some clients just use the captions we use, some of them they supplement it with their own, right, little nuances, some of them did take out the captions and did add their own. And there are other ways that we've, built the kits to ensure that you can personalize and individualize it for your brand, your voice, and your practice. So whether you purchase one of our kits or whether you continue to do it in-house, this is something you want to make sure that you continue to showcase your personality, which is social, what social media is all about. Hashtags. Okay, so that's another major aspect of your content strategy when it comes to social media, particularly on the Instagram platform. Now, what are hashtags? 
So hashtags are like joining conversations, right? They're like giving yourself a seat at the table. But with a limit of a maximum of 30 hashtags for each post, you want to ensure that you're using them most effectively to maximize your visibility. So here are some key do's and don'ts about creating an effective hashtag strategy. So first of all, you want to use up to all 30 per post with the caveat, however, that they are actually relevant, right? You don't want to just be posting 30 hashtags for the sake of using all 30 hashtags. You want to make sure that the hashtags that you're using are relevant to the content that you're posting. The other area, as I mentioned, was to make sure that they're keyword specific. So, for example, mental health therapist, if that's a field that you play in or a space that you play in, you want to be using that as a hashtag. The other thing is you want to add niche keywords. So, for example, if you specialize in anxiety, if you specialize in LGBTQ, if you're a school psychologist, you'll want to overlay that as you know, adding those niche hashtags as well. The next area is adding location, right? So if you're servicing a particular area, so for example, school psychologist Calgary, that would be a hashtag that you might want to use. The exception is if you're operating solely online and you don't want to be pigeonholed into any specific location, then you might want to negate that. But generally, location would be one that you would overlay on top of your other hashtags. Okay. Hashtag stacking system. Now, this could be a mini session all of its own, but I'm going to cover it at a high level very briefly. So by using hashtags that are too popular, your content is just going to get lost in the fray. So remember I said hashtags are like joining conversations. So just picture if you walk into a room and you have 5 million people all screaming the same thing about the same conversation, it's going to be very, very hard for you to get any voice or space on that conversation. So by joining a hash or using a hashtag that has something like 5 million or 3 million uses, it's basically the, the waste of a hashtag, right? What you want to do is the sweet spot for your hashtag is basically within the 150,000 to the 500,000 range. Now, you'll notice that's quite a large range, so there's no set in stone. It's kind of a general kind of idea. That's kind of your sweet spot. So hashtags that have the 150,000 uses to kind of 500,000 uses. That's your majority. So let's say you're using all 30 hashtags. You want to the majority. So let's say 15 of your 30 hashtags you want to keep within that, that, that sweet spot range. The other 15 you want to stack, right? So you want to take half of those. So let's say seven or eight. You want to use kind of on the larger side. So over 500,000, but not within three to four million, right? Kind of within that range. Because those are popular conversations that are being had that you want to piggyback off of that as well. The other seven or eight you want to use on the lower end of your 150,000. So just under that. And when I say under, I'm talking about kind of like your 8,000, 10,000, up to 150,000, those kinds of uses of hashtags. If it's too, now the exception, let me just say the exception to that is one strategy where people use their own branded hashtag, right? Which in which case, obviously, you'll be starting from ground zero. And in that case, that's perfectly fine. You just continue to use that hashtag consistently to be able to build brand awareness around it. The other exception is location. Um, if you're using a location specific hashtag, you're not going to get to 8, 10, 12, 15,000 because you're talking to a very specific niche target audience, which is perfectly fine. So again, school, uh, school psychologist Calgary, you might only have a few hundred or maybe a thousand, but that's okay because in that case, you are talking to a very specific niche audience. So if people search you, then you're going to come up within that, that um, particular realm, which is fine. Um, uh, so that's kind of what the overview of the stacking system. Another do is to research your hashtags. So do research what your competitors or your colleagues are using, what official organizations are using, because again, those are popular uh, conversations that are being had that you want to be able to, you want to affiliate yourselves with those conversations. And then finally, do experiment, right? So experiment, if you, every time you do a post and you click on insights on Instagram, it will actually tell you how many people are visiting your profile from your hashtag or hashtags. So if you are using the same hashtags over and over and you see it's not bringing anyone to your profile from those hashtags, you're using the wrong ones, right? Um, and that comes under kind of the don't area. So the don't area is saying don't repeat hashtags, the exact same hashtags in exact same order repeatedly. Don't do that. 
Remember, the algor algorithm at the, at the back is just looking for things like spammy behavior and bots. And if you continue to just use the same hashtags in the same order over and over, you're going to look spammy and they could sideline you. So don't do that. Don't use banned hashtags. So this is kind of a, a weird gray area that a lot of people aren't necessarily familiar with. So on random occasions, uh, Instagram would ban a hashtag. And they say it's hashtags that are offensive, which would make sense, but it's not necessarily the case. So say, for example, with Halloween coming up, they might just decide to ban hashtag Halloween, right? Um, so if you go, the way to find out if a hashtag is banned is you go and you search it, right? So you go into the Instagram, you press, you put hashtag and you put the name. And if it doesn't come up, it's banned. Just to add another layer of complexity is if Instagram bans a hashtag, it's not necessarily banned forever and a day. Right. So you might go the next day and they've brought it back. It could be two weeks later. It could be a month later and they've unbanned it so you can now use it. So it's just this weird nuanced thing. Um, I wouldn't say to go crazy about it, um, you know, go through and checking all 30 hashtags every time you post. But it's just something to be aware of. And then, as I mentioned, uh, the other thing don't do is don't go kind of like a three, four millions range because that's just a waste of a hashtag and you're just going to get lost in the free. OK. So we've covered what to post, and now we're going to start looking at how often should you be posting. So again, you've heard a lot from me, so we're going to, I'm going to pause and take a little bit of a breather. And David, if you could please launch that fourth poll. It basically is asking you guys, how often do you post on your professional Facebook or Instagram accounts, um, generally speaking? So is it daily or more? Is it two to three times per week-ish, once per week? infrequently or maybe never, or it's not applicable because you're not on either platform. So will just leave that open for a while. And David, whenever you decide to close out, if you could please just summarize that, that would be great. Okay, the responses uh, kind of uh, play out like this. Uh, no one is actually posting daily or more. 22% uh, indicate that they're posting two to three times per week or more. 4% uh, are once per week. 17% indicate infrequently. And 57% say the question is not applicable. Right. Thank you for that. Um, and that's actually pretty typical. Um, I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to share with you some best practices in terms of what they recommend best practices are for posting. And it does vary between Instagram and Facebook. So you'll see, for example, on Instagram, it is tied to the number of users that you or followers that you have. I don't think any of us are kind of within this range. We tend to be over here. But even within that, you'll see that that's quite a lot still, right? In terms of how many times they're suggesting that you post as a best practice every week. Um, and then on Facebook, it's kind of a more generic guideline. Um, it's not really tied to how many users you have, but still it's quite a lot, right? It's kind of daily um, posts. I mean, I had to uh, smile. Um, I think it was last week that I attended the webinar of one of those Instagram gurus and I'm sure you know the ones, right? The ones that have the courses and they're going to teach you how to get thousands of followers in just a few weeks, all the engagement in the world and their courses are worth thousands and thousands in value. And today, just today and just for you, if you sign up only today, you're gonna to get it for four or $500. Like we've all seen them, right? Um, I tend to call them guru events and I tend to attend them you know, occasionally just to kind of keep abreast of the landscape. Um, and the purpose of this is not to kind of throw shade on, on anybody's course or presentation. I mean, the person, this, this person was actually quite very knowledgeable. She had some great industry experience. But I just wanted to use this to illustrate what their best practice is, their best practice advice to get you all this engagement that they're talking about within the several weeks timeline that they're talking about. What does it say there? To post multiple stories throughout the day, five to 10 stories per day. So. I don't know about you, but if I was to have to come up with content and be posting five to 10 stories per day, I don't think I'd have a life. I don't think I'd be doing anything else, right? So to me, not very realistic. Um, and this is another discussion that we have quite often with our clients because they feel this immense pressure to devise and maintain this extremely rigorous posting cadence and schedule, right? Um, and even with our social media content kits, you get content within that content kit, you get two to three posts per week, 
And on top of that, you get all the commemorative posts on top of that, but that's not daily content. So what actually happens then if it is that you're posting at a less rigorous schedule? Well, the fact is that social media is still serving a business as an important 24 seven marketing channel and your social media will build, but it just means that it's going to build infinitely more slowly, right? And the other parts to building that engagement is the other huge piece of the puzzle is not just the content, but also the engagement piece and how you drive engagement. And that's something we're going to cover off a little later on as well. Okay, we're going to jump on to when to post, right? So what are the optimal times of day to post? And there are a number of ways to get insights into when your audience specifically are on your platforms that you're posting onto, because it does vary. So you have Facebook insights, right? So if you were to go to your Facebook page and you click on the little hamburger menu and it's actually called professional dashboard, you'll start to see a lot of metrics behind there, which you can start seeing, right? When are, is your audience specifically online and the best time to reach them? Instagram insights as well. When you post, you can see insights there. And the third way to figure it out is just to experiment, right? You post at different times of the day and see what garners you the most engagement. Now, if you were to look at um, just to Google it, you'll see a plethora of different examples or different recommendations as to when is the best time to post. Um, what I tend to see a lot is first thing in the morning. Um, so what I thought I would share with you is what we find works best for us and for our clients, which is across a wide variety of industries. Again, this is not suggesting that this is necessarily best for you guys. Um, right, it does vary depending on industry, depending on content, depending on audience, depending on geography. But I just thought I'd share with you what we found works best for us and our clients. So we find that between Monday to Thursday, kind of 12 to 1.30 p.m., we tend to see the most engagement. On Friday, it tends to be around 3.30 p.m.-ish, 3 to 3.30, 6 to 7 on the evening on a Saturday, 9 in the evening on a Sunday or at nighttime on a Sunday, with the caveat that if it's a commemorative post, so for example, let's say it's Mother's Day or Father's Day, we would still post it, we would post it in the morning just so that, you know, those um, greetings are there kind of all day. Um, but this is kind of what we found works for us and our clients. And I don't know about you, but does it seem to have a trend around when people kind of tend to have downtime, right? So kind of Monday to Thursday is kind of when people are on their lunch break, maybe, 3.30 is when people have mentally switched off and they're like, forget this work business. I'm like surfing the internet right now, right? I'm already in weekend mode. Six to seven, maybe when people are having downtime before they go out for an evening out. And then 9 p.m. on a Sunday when people are probably just relaxing before or chillaxing before, right? Work time. I don't know. That tends to be a trend, but it seems to be kind of a trend that I noticed. But anyway, that's kind of what kind of tends to what uh, works best for us. Um, okay, so you... Um, your professional accounts are up and running, right? You are ready to go. You have your best practices in place. You've got your social media set up, right? You figured out when to post. But the thing is, so are your competitors. Or in your case, it might be colleagues if you consider that you're not that much in a competitive space. Whether you think you're in a competitive space or not, the fact is that social media is an extremely noisy space, right? So how do you go about differentiating yourself, your brand, and your practice? The fact is that 9 million posts are posted to Instagram every single day. 350 million pictures are posted to Facebook every single day. 500 million videos posted to Facebook every single day. So it's pretty important for you to differentiate yourself and your offerings. And how would you go about doing that? Typically, what people would use is user generated content. So things like client testimonials, recommendations, right? Those tend to be the most powerful assets when it comes to a corporate space. So when you think if you're going to a restaurant, for example, or you want to buy a product, what do you do? You go on, you look at the Google reviews, right? You said you want to see what other people have said that user generated content. You would ask someone if they've used the product or they've gone to a restaurant and someone you know has been or they've used that product, you'll tend to ask them to get feedback. The fact is, in the space that you guys are operating in, a lot of people or a lot of clients may not want to, whether it's the stigma attached or whether they just want to be private, there's going to be a certain um, number of clients that won't want to stick up their hand and say, 
by the way, I'm using a therapist and they're fantastic, even if they are, even if you are, right? So what do you then do? How do you build that credibility um, and differentiate yourself? And the key here would be to use statistics and metrics, right? This is just a little um, insider information of how to do this. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to tap into research that has already been conducted, right? There's a wealth and a plethora of metrics and statistics that has already been published out there in your industry, whether it's on mental health, depression, suicide rates, a whole number of things. So we're not saying that you have to go out and reinvent the wheel. This is statistics that have already been published. And what you're going to do is you're going to take that statistic and you're then going to add your own comment and insights and by doing that, you are going to start to position yourself as an authority and as a thought leader in your space, right? And here are just some examples of how this plays out. Again, if you were to purchase one of our social media content kits, this is kind of how uh, two of our social media content themes play around statistics and metrics. One would be, we have, did, did you know is one of our content themes? And another one is kind of just solid metrics. And then it has the post to go along with that. So that's just an example of how you would use statistics and metrics. Okay, so I've mentioned a few times that engagement piece, right? So if, as I said, in marketing, content is king, then engagement really is the queen. Having great content, absolutely no doubt, is a must, right? You want to ensure that when you're driving traffic to your feed, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Instagram, whether it's some other social media platform that you're on, that your content is on point, right? And that they see a well-laid-out, professional, up-to-date profile, which we've touched on. Now what we're going to cover are some of the proactive strategies you can use to help build and drive your engagement, okay? Because what social media platforms care most about is about getting audiences to spend the most time on their platforms. So like TV ratings, right? It's the most popular is going to get the most play. So here are some um, practical strategies that you can use to start building your engagement on social media platforms. So first of all, you want to tap into your network, right? So this is a low hanging fruit one. These are people who are already your friends, your family, your colleagues, your associates, and have them like, comment, and share your content. This is one of the easier ways to start training the algorithm on the engagement value of your content. And absolutely, if Grams is on Facebook or Instagram, get Grams commenting too, right? If you, she's aware whether she's on there, you can get her on there. Get her on there, get her commenting about, right, that she's your best grandchild or that she loves your post, whatever it is, it's all engagement, take it all in, right? Use that as well. Now, another uh, best practice here is to always, as I hope you know, if you ever get a comment on any of your posts, you always respond to all your comments. Now, a quick tip here is if you get a comment on your post is to respond to any comments with a question. Okay, so here's how this works. And this is just a very simple trick. And it doesn't need to be any kind of elaborate question. So let's say you post something about fall, right? It's now end of summer, it's now coming to fall. We're looking forward to fall, the change of the season. And someone comes onto your post and they say, yeah, I, um, I love the fall. It's my favorite season, right? Rather than coming back and saying, yeah, mine too. What you want to do is you want to say, oh, yes, so is mine. Why do you love the fall? Why is it your favorite season? And what that does is that might incent the person who posted the original comment to come back and post another comment. So now what you've done is instead of having one comment from the one person, you now changed it and doubled it into two. Doesn't always work. The person won't always necessarily come back and comment a second time, but it does incent people to do that. There will be a proportion that does it. And now again, you're just kind of building that engagement, but just using that simple trick. Third area is to do your homework. Now, this is a very proactive one, right? So as often as you can, or I'm going to say at least aim for at least once a week, what you want to do is research your competitors, or in this space, it might just be your colleagues. And you're going to research the clients who follow them, right? And what you want to do is you want to make a list of the 10 clients who, who comment or engage most with your competitors or your colleagues' content. Now, what that does is you are identifying 10 people who you are know for sure are interested in the subject matter, right? If it is that they're commenting and engaging on your colleagues or your competitors' content, that means that they're interested in what you would have to post and what you'd have to say, that industry comment kind of content. And what you're going to do is you're going to take that 10, you're going to make a list, 
And every week you are going to start commenting as much as you can on those 10 clients content. So when they post something, you want to have a notification that as soon as they post something, you want to be front and center commenting on their content. What that does is engagement drives engagement, right? So if you are doing this for 10 people every week and you're continuing to post content, post on their content, it becomes reciprocal, right? They're like, who is this person that's posting content or complimenting me about my posts? And eventually you'll see, right, that a large proportion of them will start coming to your feed. They'll start posting con comments about your co uh, content and then they'll probably start following you as well, right? That's kind of how it tends to work and it tends to build. Now it's very proactive. And it's something you have to continue to do consistently, but that's kind of how it tends to work. Another strategy um, that we want to do is repost content. And what that does, it serves you in a few ways. First of all, it bolsters your social media content calendar, right? So you're not just posting your own content all the time, but you're using other industry content from other people as well. By reposting and crediting the originator of the content, again, Engagement drives engagement. They're likely to come back and see who's this person that's reposted and um, tagging me in this content, right? And they might come and start comment commenting on your posts and also following you as well. And it also helps to build and drive and expand your professional network as well. Okay, so we've covered uh, quite a lot. I'm keeping an eye on the time. So we've covered, right? We've covered um, uh, your best practices in terms of your social media profile, content, what, when, how to post. We've touched on differentiation and we've looked at engagement, but it was called five keys, right, to leveraging social media. So what's that fifth key? The final piece I want to look at very briefly is results, because the human tendency is, and we all do it, is to compare our social media accounts and engagement with other people's, right? And by that yardstick, oftentimes our engagement might seem like it's negligible or even non-existent. So I just want to share some quick examples with you. Here are three very public personas and, and figures that you're gonna be familiar with and look at what their engagement rates are. So when you look on their profile, of course, you're gonna see tens and hundreds and thousands of right, likes and comments, but I'm only getting one or two, which can be discouraging. But what you have to remember is that their engagement and what you're seeing, those con that, those, um, that engagement they're getting is as a result or it is directly tied to um, how many followers they have, right? So of course, they're going to get hundreds of thousands of likes and comments when it is that they have 500,000 or one and a half million followers. So you have to bear that in mind. When you're getting one or two, you're actually doing great and you're heading in the right direction because that's relative to how many followers you have, okay? So that's something to bear in mind. Um, uh, the other thing, so despite what I social media gurus claim, I just wanted to kind of level set expectations for you, right? First of all, as I mentioned, uh, there's no silver bullet when it comes to marketing. It's a gradual, consistent, ongoing process. Secondly, marketing is truly effective when it's an integrated strategy. So that's to say that social media should just be one part of your marketing efforts, whether you have a website, your members of a directory or associations, such as uh, the Canadian Psychological Association, Right? Whether you're using advertising, whether you are using direct mail, content marketing such as a blog, word of mouth, whatever it is, social media is going to be most effective when it's a contributor to your other marketing activities. Thirdly, social media is designed as a, a tool for engagement, right? Social media. So despite what the gurus tell you, and even with all the best practices and optimizations in place, organic social media wasn't meant as a sales channel. Right. My clients discover you on social media, reach out to you and ask about your services. Absolutely. Right. Can you use strategies to help facilitate new client acquisition? You absolutely can. And we've discussed some of those. But to leverage organic social media exclusively with the expectation that it's going to be this sales channel that is going to exponentially increase your client base all by itself without doing, especially without doing your homework, is just setting yourself and your social media strategy up for failure. Fourth, as I mentioned, do your homework, right? So you can't, even if you purchase one of our social media kits, which is um, kind of best in class social media um, content, um, professionally designed and put together, even so, you're right. If you post it, you're not going to see this plethora of engagement. You have to be doing the work as well. 
Uh, and then what I'd like to close with is just what I began with at the outset. To when you're putting all this work into your social media strategy, do remember that it can be an incredibly powerful marketing resource. So employ your best practices, remain diligent, remain consistent, and it will be a powerful tool to help you in the growth of your brand, your practice, and of your client base as well. So uh, just a few minutes left. So what I'd like to leave you with are those resources, as I mentioned, that we use throughout the presentation. First of all, our social media content kits, which are, as I mentioned, out of the box prepackaged kits, especially for therapists. When I say therapists, I mean psychologists, counselors, mental health professionals. Um, they include everything you're ready to purchase and post, including images, videos, hashtags, keywords, enough content to post two to three times per week. And in addition to that, you get all the commemorative posts that's industry specific as well. So just as a quick example, here are some of the commemorative content that would be included in, an, in the social media kit for October. And this would be on top of the two to three posts you would get per week as well, just to give you an idea. So that's one resource, of course, and other resources, we mentioned keywords. So a couple free keyword um, search tools, Ahrefs is one, um, and all the links to this will I'll give to you at the end. Mars is another free keyword uh, tool. You'd notice, for example, I searched Therapists Ottawa, and it will show you the list of keywords associated with that, as well as the number of times that keyword, specific keyword has been searched in a month. This is another free keyword tool, uh, the Keyword Cheetah, which I find this one, it's more robust than the previous two. The only thing is that it doesn't show you how many times that keyword has been used or searched for in a month. So it, it doesn't give you an idea of how highly to rank it or how much importance to place on that keyword. But you certainly can use this in, in conjunction with the other uh, keyword tools. A couple of social media management tools. So these are can make your social media very efficient as well. So you sit down for 20, 30 minutes, you queue up all your social media content, and then it just runs automatically according to how you set up throughout the month. Right, so you're not having to jump on and post it each time. We used to use later. Now that our client base has expanded, we now use Social Pilot. Just to be completely transparent, um, Social Pilot, uh, we are affiliates. So if you do use the link and purchase it, we will get a kickback for that. But there's also a free social media management tool here as well. You can use entirely for free. Um, later blog, there are a wealth of resources that you can use to keep abreast, as I mentioned, to keep abreast of best practices when it comes to social media. The reason I chose this one is because it's very practical, it's very succinct, um, they don't use any technical jargon, they use a lot of screen caps, um, uh, so it's very easy to follow and it's very easy to just keep up to date with um, best practices in terms of what's happening with social media. These are all the links, um, which I'll share with you guys at the end. And then this is us. So I know, sorry, it was right on time. I don't know if you guys want to stay for questions. I know it's um, pretty much on the hour. Uh, I just wanted to pack it with as much uh, practical best practices for you guys to use as possible. Um, do feel free to reach out to us uh, with any questions, whether it's about Smack It, whether it's about social media or marketing in general. Um, that's our contact details. If it hasn't come across, um, apparently, you know, we are very passionate about marketing. It sounds corny, but it's true. So feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Um, and thank you for attending. Thank you for sharing this hour with us. I hope you found something um, new uh, and interesting that you're able to use today to level up your social media profile and I'll share those resources with you. Thank you, Crystal. We do have a couple of questions in the chat uh, and I have allowed extra time in the uh, on the platform so uh, don't you don't have to feel rushed or anything if you'd like to have a look at the couple of the questions that are there. Um, I cannot so you may have to read them out because on my oh, platform I can I cannot see the okay. yeah. <clears throat> Um, uh, Rachel is asking, what made you choose the mental health field and how did this come about in terms of uh, the, um, the specific focus on mental health for this, uh, for this package? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so as I mentioned, when I started um, Marketing Made Easy as uh, an agency, it really started out of, um, although I've been in marketing for over 20 years, it started out of COVID simply because um, I really saw you know, how damaging that was to small businesses in particular. I mean, you saw people who lost their shirts through, right? They put all their lives and hearts and soul into businesses and they just lost it more or less overnight through COVID. And I knew that marketing is something that is such a powerful tool that can really get help organizations get back up on their feet to be able to let people know they're still around. They're offering these services, they're offering these products. Um, so that was kind of the marketing side of things, uh, why we started our agency. And in terms of why therapy specifically that we launched into first, um, again, I mean, I don't need to tell you guys about um, what the impact of COVID has been on right people, whether it's mental health from a financial standpoint, emotionally. Um, I mean, you're really seeing some devastating effects in terms of whether it's exacerbated, right, issues that were already there or whether it's just being highlighted now. But we were certainly we're certainly devastated every time we see, you know, kids as young as five or seven being impacted by right things like suicide and, and different things. So when we were thinking about <clears throat> how can we have the most impact on leveraging, right, or providing that empowerment to a particular field or a particular set of um, professionals that can use our products and services, very low cost, um, well-built services and resources, how can we have the most impact and helping people to help others? Like therapists obviously came to mind. So that was kind of a no brainer for us in terms of making it um, available to this industry first. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephanie is asking uh, if it's a good idea to reuse the same post or a version of, of it on different, different social media platforms. Yeah, I mean, you certainly can. I mean, we do that a lot on between Facebook and Instagram. Um, when you start to look a little bit broader, um, you do want to bear in mind what that audience is and what that demographic is, what they're there for. Um, so that's where you might have to start tweaking it, right? So for example, if you're using a post on Facebook or Instagram, and then you're looking to post the same thing on LinkedIn, LinkedIn is a lot of people, right? Different, it's a different audience. People are there for a different reason. Um, the way they search is different. Different. Um, the entertainment value is different. So that's when you might want to start tweaking it a little bit in terms of the types of content or how you would present that content between say an Instagram or a LinkedIn, for example, you might want to put a little bit more of a spin to in terms of business best practices or hiring new staff, or um, it might be a little bit different in terms of the value or how you would position that content. Okay, great. And Rachel has asked uh, uh, that you uh, mentioned that the, the kits are um, purchased for uh, four weeks and she's just wondering what happens after the four weeks. Yeah, so the kits come in, a, it's a four week kit, <clears throat> everything ready to purchase on post four. So when you purchase it, it covers the next four weeks. Um, and at the moment, what we have everything queued up so that if you purchase a kit, we have automated reminders would go out to you to remind you when your kit is up and when your new kit is ready so that it would finish. It would be exactly in time to write your kit finishes now. And this is your next kit um, so that there's no downtime in your posting cadence at all. Um, we are working towards um, putting in a subscription model in place so that right it becomes even easier for um, our clients so that once you sign up then you're able to right you just purchase it and then it just kind of it will drop into your inbox you literally don't even have to come back and purchase it it's literally just kind of it will be in your inbox ready to post every month and that's something we're working towards in the short term <laughs>